Tomorrow Shaping Today. The theme for tonight's talk is central to my belief as an educator. But that hasn't always been the case. When I entered the, the profession more than 20 years ago, my concern was how I would mold young minds, how I would teach students to impact the future and thereby leave my legacy. As I prepare the students that enter the Master of Arts in Teaching program here at ULM, I find that their focus is much the same as mine was. They're full of energy. They're full of expectation. They're full of the belief in the change that they will make. Sometimes that changes drastically. When does it happen? When they enter the classroom. And I'm sure you might think, of course, we know the current standard of education in America, high stakes testing, administrative oversight, accountability. Why wouldn't they be frustrated? But surprisingly, that's not the number one thing that they name. What is it? It's the kids. The kids? Actually, it's more like these kids. These kids are distracted. These kids are not internally motivated. These kids are disengaged. These kids seem to have a hard time with social interaction. That's their takeaway. So the question automatically becomes, why and what can we do about it? Let's first talk about the why. In American schools today, research shows that the majority of teachers are around the age of 42. That's my age. I was called an i -Jenner. I'm sorry, I was called a Gen Xer. Get those a little confused. And Gen Xers, what did we know about them? Well, in my time in the classroom, we did not have personal laptop computers. We didn't know anyone who had a cell phone. How is that different from what we see with our students who are considered i generous The I stands for interactive, international. The difference is these students have never known a time when touch technology didn't exist. They've never known a time when they weren't able to digitally share media. That sets up a juxtaposition in the classroom. I would be considered a digital immigrant. What do we know about these people? We were accustomed more to single task. We learned through text and we communicated well through text. Most of us are linear thinkers. And we were taught and grew up in a time when we had limited resources. How is that different from the students that we teach now that can sometimes be uh, called digital natives? Well, the digital native is accustomed to having multiple resources. Parallel thinking is, is the rule of the day. And they are, have access to multimedia at their fingertips and on demand. <coughs> and we all know if you have a teenager anywhere in your vicinity, they are the masters of the multitask. So, is this just the characteristic of the generation? Is this our perception? Well, there's research now, newer scientists have done at Harvard to show that it's not just our perception that these students seem to be easily distracted. There's research to show that there is such a thing as digital ADD, <laughs> brought about by the constant interaction that these children have with their digital resources, usually used at the same time. Downloading music, watching a movie, playing a game. In addition, it's also been shown that the students do actually lack, lack those face-to-face -face skills because they have limited face-to-face -face interaction. But the research also shows that there might be some positive these students are also able, or this generation of people are also able, to be able to siphon through a large amount of data. 
at a very efficient rate and also a very quick rate of speed. So what does that mean to us as educators? What does that mean about our students in the classroom? Well, it tells us the times are changing. And it's not just the kids. If you'll take a look at the chart, it shows that Forbes released a report naming the 10 highest paying jobs in America as of 2015. Most of those things on the chart won't surprise us. They are professions from the medical field, professions that require advanced training and terminal degree, and they've been on there for quite some time. But there's one profession there that might surprise you or get your attention, and for one reason, it might be because you don't know what it is. You've never heard of it before. A data scientist, why is it significant? For one reason, that job did not exist five years ago. But now it is the <clears throat> highest paying job in America. Additionally, Forbes, re re Forbes put out another report that said that the top 20 fastest growing jobs in America were similar here to this. There were things in the medical field, things in the legal field, but there also was a job that would catch your interest because it also did, uh, did not uh, exist five years ago, but it's growing at a rate of 37%. The job of an inform information security analyst, we're familiar with that. If you know anything about the name Target, you know that we actually need that. <laughs> but that suggests to us, it's not just the kids, but it's the world that's changing. This quote was attributed to Margaret Mead almost 100 years ago. And it speaks to tonight's theme, tomorrow shaping today. It is what our school system is supposed to be doing. It should look like or mirror what our students will be asked to do and know in the future. So in education, when we have these concerns about the children, we know that the times are changing. But we know we have to prepare them for college and career and for their futures. Why is this significant? It's significant because if we realize that there is truly a difference with today's children, there should be a difference with today's education system. It will not come about by just having another educational reform. It won't come about by adopting another textbook. And it won't come about by just saying that we'll have another set of standards. What it will require is a complete paradigm shift. And what is that, a paradigm shift? A paradigm shift is a complete revolution in our concepts. It revolutionizes the way that we look at things by a change of perspective. And I present to you that that's what's necessary in the field of education if we're to make the types of leaps that we would like to with our children in this generation. These four skills, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication, they have been deemed the four C's and labeled as the 21st century skills. But I don't know about you, I wasn't born in the 21st century and I'd heard of all of these. <laughs> At some point in time, during my academic um, uh, upbringing, they were referred to over and over and over again. The tasks that we were asked to do were linked to these types of skills. So why is it that they're labeled as the 21st century learning skills? Well, as we look at the landscape of the day and understand what our children will be facing, we realize that these are the skills that will be most necessary to help them be successful in college and career in today's current job market. In order to prepare students in this way, we realize we're going to have to involve them in rich contextual learning tasks and rich contextual learning environments in order to be able to accomplish this. So let's talk about, now that we know the what or why, let's talk about how we will actually be able to address it. The integration of technology has been shown 
to help students that are accustomed to um, utilizing technology as a tool for social media and socialization or false socialization. <coughs> it's shown to be effective in bringing those types of rich contextual learning experiences to the students. So if you look to the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see some things that look more traditional. Paper and pencil assessment, students sitting in a room, being uh, spoken to or sitting in a lecture. It doesn't mean that those things are no longer necessary, but when we think about culturally responsive teaching and how we're supposed to connect with those students and make learning relevant to them, then we realize that we need to spend some more time away from those types of activities and make sure that we're able to truly integrate technology. And I know there's someone standing there or sitting there and thinking that we've known that. We're doing that. We're integrating technology. I boast to school that there's a smart board in every room. We're integrating technology. Well, what we know about technology integration is if you're able to do the exact same activity that you are showing on your smart board by just simply downloading, printing it off, passing it out to your kids, and letting them fill it out on paper and pencil, that's not technology integration. You've just enhanced your lesson and switched out the tools, but the rich, deep learning hasn't taken place. In order to do that, we've got to give them interdisciplinary activities. Use problem-based learning and project-based learning in order to be able to capitalize on their strengths in the area of technology. For that same reason, we decided with those students coming into the Master of Arts and Teaching program to give them that type of an experience we partnered together with two community um, organizations in order to be able to provide a STEM camp to students in our community. As a part of that, we made sure that we were using next generation science standards and the Common Core state standards to be sure that it was standards based. But the most important uh, part that we were looking at was to make sure that the students were being <laughs> immersed in the learning and had an opportunity to be involved in interdisciplinary activities. As a result, you'll see pictures of girls between the ages of 8 and 12 that were able to build, program, and then race robots. You'll see girls that built rockets and had to determine how to make sure that the thrust was just right so that those rockets could be launched. And then we have some students that were involved in an eight-day program uh, between the grades of 6th and 8th grade. And they were involved in CSI investigations to use RH factoring and um, DNA testing to try to find out who done it. And that type of project or problem-based learning always leads to authentic assessment. We were able to assess what they did without the paper and pencil. And not only that, the students were able to assess their own learning because if a robot doesn't work and can't make it through the maze, you know something went wrong. If the rocket doesn't make it off the ground, there's a problem. Houston, we have a problem. That last picture shows a group of students that were involved in a community-based program where they were talking about a uh, current event, which was police brutality that was affecting their community. They were able to do research online they were able to be involved in a Socratic seminar so they could choose a position. And then after receiving some training on <clears throat> videotaping and editing, they created a public service announcement that they shared with people in the community that talked about the best way for their people in their community to interact safely with the police. This type of learning, as I said before, involves rich contextual experience things that students are able to be able to master the skills and the concepts as well as make real life connections with the learning itself. So I'm sure that there's some people that understand. It's great for us to say that it works, but where's the proof? Well, at the end of the four days with those girls between the grades of third and sixth grade, based upon a pre and post test, looking at raw scores only, they were able to increase in four days by 24% from a pre to a post test. And after eight days with these students that were in the fifth through the eighth grade, 
we were able to see an increase of 35%. Now, imagine if this type of learning was taking place on a regular basis in every classroom, in every city, in every state in the United States, if we would be able to see the types of uh, student achievement that we've been looking for, then instead we've been testing them to find what they could produce. Lastly, what I found after conducting these types of um, activities with the students is that they realized then that they had been empowered with this knowledge how to bring that type of deep learning to their students. And instead of feeling frustrated and overwhelmed, despite the administrative oversight, they realized that it was still the teacher that makes the difference in the classroom, even in the 21st century. And they were able to go into the new school year realizing that they could work with tomorrow in, tomorrow in mind and cast a vision for the future of their students. Thank you very much.